We're going to aim to take back or uh, claw back a little bit of the time um, by having slightly less time for questions and answers in this next session. Uh, but if you have questions that we don't get time to answer today, please do continue to feed them through and we'll uh, aim to get back to you in the coming days where possible. So our first themed session of today is on the accessibility of employment. And I'm now very happy to welcome Siobhan McKenna, who is the head of equality, diversity and inclusion at the Public Appoints Service, which many of you know is the primary recruiter for the civil service. And Siobhan is going to chair this session. Over to you, Siobhan. Hi, I'm, I hope everybody can hear me. Um, so thanks for that introduction. Um, yeah, Siobhan McKenna, the um, Head of Equality, Diversity and Inclusion since about March of last year. Um, and for those who are visually impaired, I'm a mixed race Irish woman. Um, I was four years behind Caroline Casey in school, so you guys can do the maths on that. <laughs> And I have a blue blazer and a black skirt on, and I wrestled my hair into a bun this morning. So um, great to be here. It's been such an inspiring morning. Um, Caroline Case is a tough act to follow, let me say. Um, and so we're a bit tight for time. So without further ado, I'm going to really quickly introduce the panel. They are all going to make presentations. So they will talk you through their work. So I will keep their bios really short. Um, and so then immediately, immediately Beside me is Professor Kim Huck from King's College in London. Um, Kim has been working in this space for quite a while, I think it's fair to say. Um, in 2013, he co-founded Disability at Work, and in 2020, which is a research group. And in 2021, along with some leading charities and trade unions, he co-founded the Disability Employment Charter, which he's going to talk about uh, a bit later. Next to Kim um, is Pamela Uwakwe. I hope I got that right. Um, Pamela joined the Department of Justice in February 2021 as assistant principal with the organization design and development team. And prior to joining the department, Pamela worked in the private sector uh, for several years. And she's also worked with the United Nations and the Department of Foreign Affairs. And beside Pamela is Caroline, be very familiar to many of you. Caroline McGrotty is the employment manager with a head. And I think today is her 10th anniversary with a head, so congratulations, Caroline. Um, Caroline oversees a head's projects, Get Ahead and WAM, which focuses on the transition from employment or from uh, studies to employment for students uh, who graduate college. Um, and she holds qualifications in deaf studies, Irish sign language teaching, equality studies, and is currently undertaking a master's by research in deaf education with DCU. And beside Caroline is Emma Bennett Wren. And Emma was on the uh, uh, WAM program. And she graduated in 2021 with a degree in biochemistry from UCD. Um, and she started her professional journey um, in July in Pfizer's of Newbridge as a quality controlled chemist. And she has progressed onto their two year Pfizer graduate program there. And Emma is going to talk us through her experiences there. So, um, that's it. Really looking forward to this. So without further ado, I'm going to hand, hand over to Kim. Thank you very much. OK, hello, everybody. Um, it's lovely to see you all here. It's a, a fabulous audience that we've got today. Thank you very much for the invite to come along and talk. So uh, just to start off with, I'm a mixed race male. Uh, I'm got, I have uh, dark hair. I nearly forgot then. I have dark hair. Um, I'm wearing rimless glasses and I'm wearing a grey suit. Right, so what I'm going to do today is talk to you about the, uh, largely about the Disability Employment Charter. Um, but if you will indulge me just for a moment, I will try and make this work, which it doesn't seem to want to do. What do I press to make this go on? Go. It's the, oh, is it? Oh, marvellous. OK, <laughs> slight, slight delayed reaction. Um, just a little bit about disability at work. So you've got a bit of background in terms of the research that I've done in this field over the years. So the idea of disability work, we came together group of researchers focusing on disability about eight or nine years ago now uh, to say, well, look, all the work that we do, we don't just want it sitting in academic journals. We want it in front of ministers, civil servants, all the people who can actually use that research, inform policy discussion and so on and so forth. So if you take a look on our website, you'll see we've got an awful lot of policy uh, briefs in a range of different areas. And it's really, nobody reads our academic articles. I mean, why would you? Um, it's the briefs are the things that actually really people read and they're the things that make a difference. So this is just a list of some of the things that we've done research on over, I won't go through all of these because I've been told I need to be careful of time, um, but these are some of the things that we've done research on over time. So do take a look at that um, 
And if there's anything that looks interesting to you, then by all means do get in touch uh, with me to discuss further. Okay, so just by way of start, this is, I'm sure this is just a little bit of background in terms of the UK, in terms of disability employment outcomes at the current time. I'm sure you have similar figures that are probably equally shocking here in, in, in Ireland as we, as we have in the UK. But the situation we're in at the moment in terms of the disability employment gap is that this is large and enduring. Okay, at the moment, around about 53.5% of disabled people are in work in comparison with 81.6% of non-disabled people. Now, the government would look at this graph and say, well, look, it has actually reduced since 2013. It has come down. So, you know, progress is being made. But I think if you look at what's happened to the right hand side of that graph, you can see that from uh, the middle of 2019 onwards, there's actually been no progress whatsoever. Uh, the disability employment gap has flatlined. It's going absolutely nowhere in terms of actually seeing things getting better. And if you look at the disability pay gap in the UK, uh, this is even worse. So this has actually got worse over time. These are figures from the Office of National Statistics that show that from 2013-14 onwards, the disability pay gap has increased. So there's no sense that we're seeing any improvement in terms of disabled people's employment outcomes in the UK. On top of that, there's evidence to suggest that when you look at the in-work experience of disabled people, so their levels of job satisfaction, their levels of well-being, their levels of work-life balance, for example, these are all poorer than is the case for, for non-disabled people. So there's evidence around that too. So the key question then is what can be done to address disability employment disadvantage? The obvious question to ask. So our main argument in relation to this is that we need a much greater focus on the demand side. And what we mean by that is on employers, what employers can and should be doing to up their game from the point of view of the way in which they employ disabled people, their attitudes towards disabled people, breaking down barriers in the workplace and so on. The government focus has largely been on the supply side, okay, in terms of labour market activation policies, essentially looking at ways in which you can get disabled people off benefits into job seeking activity and then subsequently into work. Some of these approaches have taken been better than others. So Work capability assessments, very, very controversial in the UK. Um, they're very, very harsh in many ways, these assessments, and very often appeals against them are successful. Um, at the other end of the scale, we have things like the intensive personalised employment support uh, program. Now, that is actually pretty good, the research that's been done on that. Um, and, you know, it does suggest that it has sort of quite positive outcomes, quite significant net gains. Uh, but these tend to be quite small uh, scale. So, you know, one of the things that we argue is that these sorts of schemes need to be scaled up quite significantly. So that's all well and good, but our argument is, is that we need this greater demand side focus on the basis that it really doesn't matter what you do on the supply side if there aren't jobs for disabled people to go into. So if the workplace is in any way hostile towards disabled people, if disabled people are continually coming up against barriers in terms of getting into work or staying in work, you can really put whatever supply side support you want to in place, they're not going to work unless the workplace becomes a more accessible place for disabled people. So that's an argument that we've made. It's also an argument of recent reports, uh, the first of which I was involved in uh, for the All Party Parliamentary Group for Disability. Um, the second, the Centre for Social Justice uh, Disability Commission uh, report that was published last year um, also made the same argument around the demand side. It's an argument which is gaining considerable traction now. But in terms of the demand side and in terms of just how far we have to go to make workplaces accessible, we would argue there is a long way still to go. Right? So this is some evidence which you would argue is old now. So this is evidence from 2011. We've got no real reason to think that employers have necessarily improved dramatically from this time. And this is the, still the best data we have because this is nationally representative uh, data across the whole of Britain. Now, what it suggests is that the majority of organisations, well over 60% of organisations, claim on paper to uphold disability equality uh, policies. So disability uh, uh, equality um, 
statements, formal written statements, that's something that is actually quite common across organisations. But do organisations actually have the underpinning practices that you would expect a good disability equality employer to have? And the answer to that question is for a lot of organisations, no they don't. Okay? And as the figures here show, so only 10% only of workplaces with five or more employees monitor or review recruitment and selection and promotion by disability. Uh, only 3% review pay rates by disability. Only 8% of workplaces have special procedures to attract job applicants from disabled people. So what this suggests is that a lot of disability equality policy statements where employers make claims on their websites and their recruitment materials and, and whatever else, saying, yes, we're an equal opportunities employer, we take disability issues terribly seriously, that these are essentially empty shell policies policies, that when you actually look at whether, whether there are practices, substantive practices underpinning them, very often that is actually not the case. So enter the Disability Employment Charter. So this, if you like, is our latest attempt to have a go at trying to push this agenda and also importantly pushing forward with government the sorts of things that government can do to effectively try to bring about progress where employers are concerned. So the founder members of the Charter are Disability at Work, which is us, the Disability Rights UK, uh, Leonard Cheshire, Scope, uh, the uh, Shaw Trust Foundation, uh, the DFN Charitable Foundation, Unison and the University of Warwick. Now the Charter in many senses was a response to the National Disability Strategy uh, which was published last year. Um, that we essentially looked at this. The government made all these arguments that it was going to be ambitious and transformative. Boris Johnson told us it was going to be a once in a lifetime uh, step change in the lives of disabled people. This was going to be revelatory. And, and ultimately, all it announced was a few consultations, a few reviews, and very little in terms of substantive practice. So we looked at this and said, well, look, there's a lot the government could have done. There's a lot that it should have done. It could have gone significantly further in terms of the policies that it announced. Um, on top of this, the strategy was sorry, the, the, the Charter was very much uh, a, an attempt to counter the divide and rule that we often came up against when we talked to government. So very often you go to talk to government and about some of the sorts of things that are in the Charter and the government's response will be, the response from the civil service will be, well, that's all very interesting, that's all you know, fascinating what you said, but we have very little notion as to just how widespread the support for these proposals would actually be. So we said, well, look, if we all come together, we form a charter where we outline what it is that we would like the government to do, then that effectively takes that argument away from government. There's no way they can say that there's no consensus around the sorts of things that we're calling for, because in a sense it's, it's in unity there is strength. Right? The idea that we have a charter that we've all put our name to, we're making it absolutely clear to government what it is that we want them to do. And importantly, we get other people to sign up to it too, really demonstrating just how much their support is for what we're calling for. So what the charter does, it outlines proposals in nine key areas of disability employment policy that we think the government should implement. Uh, we developed it during 2021, very, very careful piloting. We launched it in the third week of October last year with 37 signatories. And we had a Shore Trust uh, round table as a launch event at which Caroline Casey spoke uh, very favourably uh, very favorably about what we were trying to do. Also a fair bit of media coverage, so the independent newspaper covered the launch and then we had subsequent media coverage on ITV News and BBC Radio 4. So in terms of what exactly have we done with it since its launch, well it says now that we have 115 signatories, that's actually 120, we've, 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 we've broken the 120 barrier, um, we've signed up all of the country's leading disability charities and we also have both Unite as a signatory and we have Unison on board as well as a founder member, which means we have the two main, uh, the largest trade unions in the UK uh, on board as well. A growing number of corporate firms, so Page Group, which is an FTSC 250 firm, has signed as of McDonald's, Schroeder's, CMS Law, Bled & Chalcott, Publicist Group, 
Herbert Smith Freehills and the Post Office. British Paralympic Association have signed, as have a growing number of uh, NHS Foundation Trusts. So this has been great to see. The sort of support that we've had for all of this has just been absolutely wonderful. And this really does send a message to government around the amount of uh, the appetite out there, I guess, for substantive policy change and also consensus in terms of what that change should comprise. Organisations don't sign up to this lightly at all. Right? They will not sign unless they actually genuinely believe what it is that we're calling for. So we've had meetings with Chloe Smith, who is the former Minister for Disabled people. She's now the Secretary of State for Work and Pensions. She has said on numerous occasions she will be happy to work with us in terms of looking to implement the Charter's uh, key recommendations. We've also had meetings with the DWP team leading on the Government's Review of Disability Confidence, the Cabinet Office team leading on the Consultation on Disability Workforce reporting, and they've sort of come back very favourably in terms of the sorts of things that we're calling for. We've also had some fabulous meetings with Labour as well. So this goes across the political divide. So we've talked to the Shadow Minister uh, for Disability about the Charter. Uh, I've had discussions with Angela Rayners, uh, who is the Deputy Labour Leader, uh, about getting the, um, with her political advisor, uh, about getting the Charter into Labour's uh, election manifesto. So it really does show just how much both sides of the political divide have actually taken to the Charter and see the value in terms of what we're trying to do. But what I would say, none of those conversations would have happened without the Charter. The Charter itself is nothing but seven or so hundred words on a piece of paper. What's given it its potency is the fact that so many organisations have now signed up to it. Um, if it wasn't for that, we wouldn't be having these. So they, really, the Charter has got us into these conversations and has enabled us to really push forward uh, with the sorts of proposals that we would like to see and in many ways has mainstreamed those proposals within uh, discussions with uh, government. Now what I've got now is a few slides that run through what the Char Charter's proposals are but I have approximately 45 seconds <laughs> left to talk about them so I'll talk about them very quickly. The first is employment and pay gap reports so mandatory disability employment and pay gap reporting is the first thing we call for. The second supporting disabled people into employment this is supply side stuff around apprenticeships, around supported internships, which we think are important. They're there at the moment, but they need to be scaled up. Um, reform of the access to work scheme, which is the scheme that the government has in place to provide reasonable adjustments uh, for uh, disabled people. Um, the fourth is, I don't know if you know about disability confident, but this is an accreditation that employers can go for to demonstrate they're doing the right sort of things around disability. At the moment, it's focused on processes and policy, uh, the sorts of policies they've got into place. We think it should be focused on outcomes. You should not be accredited as a disability confidence employer unless you can demonstrate you actually employ a substantive number of disabled people. Procurements, there's a lot of government spend that can be leveraged to improve disabled people's employment outcomes by essentially getting companies to compete on the basis of their um, disability employment uh, data, uh, various uh, recommendations in terms of workplace adjustments. Seven, I think, is really important. This whole notion we were talking about earlier that if you really want to know as a company how to do things, you consult. You consult, consult, consult with disabled people in terms of finding out the sorts of things that they want to see put into place. Point seven feeds into that. Point eight, advice and support, creating a one-stop shop portal so there is no excuse for employers to say they don't know how to do things. This is about making sure they have the advice they need. And then finally, a measure which is related to uh, a, a recommendation related to measurement in terms of how employers might better monitor, monitor national progress uh, on uh, disability employment. So that's me. I've just about made it in time. Um, this is our website here. Um, do check it out. Do take a look at it. Um, I'd be fascinated to hear what you make of it. And if you've got any questions, uh, that'd be absolutely wonderful. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you so much for that. Thank you for that, Kim. Pamela? Just move this along. Okay. So good afternoon, everybody. I'm really delighted to be here. Um, I'm a, I'll describe myself as well. So I'm another mixed race woman, half Irish, half Nigerian, short um, curly hair, and where I've got black glasses 
um, wearing a black blazer and a black and white dress. And as I say, I'm really delighted to be here today. So my presentation is actually going to cover um, how the Department of Justice um, used an equality, diversity, and inclusion maturity model to develop, to develop our first EDI strategy. Um, so I, as you may be aware, the Department of Justice has lead responsibility for um, public safety, national security, promoting justice, and safeguarding human rights. Um, and uh, one of the things that one of the, the things that that was really um, uh, very interesting for me when I joined the department, I joined the organization design and development team, is that um, I actually um, was really delighted to be given the role of actually leading on the development of, our, of, of the first strategy for the department. The strategy is actually um, for, our for our department staff. Um, and just in terms of the broader context, um, I think what was really critical is that we have, uh, we already had an EDI and public sector duty committee, um, and that was, that was comprised of representatives from across the organization at a senior level. So we really had that really senior commitment right from the start. Um, the, the, um, the, the strategy was also designed really in terms of the broader context to help the department meet a number of our obligations across the various national strategies and also to kind of ad address our obligations under the um, Section 42 of the Human Rights and Equality Commission, so basically our public sector duty um, obligations as well. And what we wanted to do and we're very conscious of right from the start was that our EDI strategy in terms of being able to very much be integrated in terms of, what the, of the department's work was that it would be a core component to helping us um, uh, fulfill our mission, which is to work for a safe, uh, fair and inclusive island, and was also very, very closely aligned with our, with our values, which were refreshed the year before of being open, collaborative and professional. So we kind of set our EDI strategy within this overall context um, as we started off to develop it. The other, the other thing in terms of our leadership role is that um, um, as we we were the department as well as the the um, Gardashir corner were co-sponsors of Action 16. Action 16 is one of the um, uh, actions under the our, our public service reform program, and Action 16 is actually focused on um, promoting equality, diversity, and inclusion across the civil service. And as I say, our Secretary General and the and the Garda Commissioner were co-sponsors and and led on this. And as part of our commitment, the Department of Justice undertook to pilot um, this EDI equality model and then provide feedback to, um, across the civil service on, on the outcomes of our pilot. So we, we decided to use the equality, diversity and inclusion model that was developed um, for the public service um, as a self-assessment tool to really help us identify gaps and to set us on our way to develop our EDI strategy. And what we actually had, the, the EDI uh, maturity model, it's actually quite a concept conceptual tool. Um, there's, there's five areas that you look at, which is inclusive leadership, diversity data, recruitment, training and development, and culture. And then for each of those areas, there's specific criteria to determine where your organization is from the from from the early stages in terms of being compliant, and then as you move across the model to, to being leading. So it's quite a, it's quite a comprehensive um, framework. And, um, and we, we undertook as part of our commitment to test it out, and then just to kind of you know, share our lessons across the civil service. So essentially what um, our approach to this, as I say, one of the challenges that we did have is because it is a conceptual framework, was actually how to break it down and to use it practically to help us develop our, um, our our strategy. Um, so we undertook a number of steps in terms of consultation, design, um, and we also undertook a, a, a kind of um, a targeted engagement. I would just kind of po focus just in the interest of time that what the approach that we actually took, having spoken to people, was to really come up and uh, gather um, uh, our uh, staff's perceptions of where we were on our, e on our EDI journey, as well as looking at some evidence base. So to give us a rounded view about where we were on our, on our EDI journey. And what we actually did then is um, we developed, broke down the tool and developed a perception survey so that when you're looking at inclusive leadership, um, you know, the department, one of the criteria was that the department's senior managers are familiar with the concepts of equality discrimination nation and seek to comply with the statutory obligations. To be able to get feedback on this, um, we, we, we ran an, an engagement process and people were to be able to give feedback about whether they strongly agreed, somewhat agreed, or didn't know. Um, and we took, we broke down each of the criteria to be able to engage with our, with our staff networks, our disability liaison officer, everybody 
who's involved in the national strategies to get that rounded view of where across a large department people perceived and believed we were. Um, we also complemented this then with kind of evidence-based, and we went through all of our policies and procedures looking at their criteria. So does the department, one of the criteria is does the department have a coherent set of policies and practices to enhance EDI, e.g. reasonable adjustments, flexible working, and we actually were able to assess whether um, you know we meet the cri this criteria, whether there's been progress, and where was the actual evidence, as well as looking at our available diversity data, which, um, to be honest, we, we have been published the gender pay gap report was around gender and disability. And so we looked at all of that, and what we essentially did then was try to, to map where we were as a starting point, which gave a baseline. Um, and, and as I say, going through that process actually meant that um, instead of just having our, our management board kind of feel pressure to show that we're leading or whatever or further around, around, along the maturity model, it really allowed a very open and honest discussion within the department. And it kind of grounded everybody and gave us a really good baseline for starting off and also allowed us to kind of air a lot of the, the issues. But the real value of it then also was that it was it in terms of being able to progress along the maturity model, it also gave us where the actions that we needed to to address and we then incorporated those actions you know into our into our actual strategy as well so um, what what we what we ended up doing is we were kind of cognizant that it was a self assessment process and while we developed our, our provisional actions we ran a very extensive consultation process uh, with focus groups so we could get um, you know feedback and lived experience from our staff we also ran an external engagement process with a lot of civil society organisations two round tables to really validate the findings and get feedback on and really kind of um, you know um, strengthen a lot of our a lot of our draft actions um, um, for our strategy and what what we've what we've come up with is kind of three key three key outcomes for our strategy. The first one is really our public-facing work. So even it, even though it is an, a strategy for the department, what was really important is that everybody in the department could see themselves and their work in the strategy. And so it is it is also EDI will impact in terms of how we de develop policy and uh, going forward. It'll also really be uh, really about um, how improving accessibility and how we de develop services. Um, the second outcome then is very much focused on. A diverse organization and skilled workforce and we have a number of actions um, under under that category as well and then the third outcome is a, the, the third outcome is also around um, being a being an inclusive organization and everybody feeling that valued and being able to contribute uh, within the organization so as I said in terms of some of the outcomes uh, some of the actions on the outcome one um, we you, you know we're, we're also um, incorporating universal um, design um, principles Principles into, uh, say, for our, uh, for example, in our service design and customer insights team, and those customer out um, um, actions plans that are going to be developed um, going forward. In terms of outcome two, um, we do participate in the willing in the willing and able mentoring program. We've established a traveller aroma program. We've also, under our L and D learning and development, a number of, of um, uh, awareness sessions linked to, dis to dis disability issues, and we're also incorporating. And accessibility issues into the way that we into our requests and procurement of all of our training as well, um, and we're seeing some encouraging signs in terms of our um, our latest um, uh, disability census for 20, up until 2021 recorded that 8.6 percent of staff um, were, were open about um, disclosing a, a disability, which has been a huge increase in previous years, and we think this has been down to the good work of our disability liaison officer and our access team, um, you know, and and just being people been feeling a bit more comfortable in terms of being able to discuss this. And thank, this is just the final slide, really. And it's just really to say that, as I say, the strategy, our strategy was launched in March. So we're very much at the implementation stage. Uh, we have our EDI committee that will kind of keep the pressure on and keep this kind of top and center. And I think one of the key things that, that, that I particularly learned through the process was having that leadership commitment. And actually, for a large department, there's over 2,700 staff across 
across 11 locations. Actually, it was very valuable to go through this very kind of um, uh, comprehensive, robust process to really get that engagement and get that baseline and get uh, people in the organization um, contributing and really shaping the design of our strategy. And a lot of the resources and case studies are actually on um, the Department of Public Expenditures website as well. So in terms of you know the, the perception survey and, and the actual checklist and really practical tools are available that we've shared and, feed, and fed back that, might, that you might find useful as well. Thanks very much. I hope I managed the time well. Thanks for that, Pamela. And can I just say that we've recently used that uh, maturity model in pass uh, for a Deloitte EDNI review we did, and it gave us a really useful framework against which we could benchmark ourselves. So hats off to the Justice Department. Caroline. Uh, so good afternoon, everybody. <clears throat> my name is Carolyn McGrotty. This is my sign name, uh, brushing my hair here. And I am here from the AHEAD organization. And we have the Willing and Able and Mentoring program to talk about today. And I am signing, obviously, so I'll be going between the clicker and signing. So some of you would be aware already of WAM. Uh, some of you may not know. It was set up in 2005 under the projects, one of the projects under AHEAD. And it was funded by the Department of Social Protection. And we have up to the point we have 600 people have secured positions to date. And really, the objectives were really about promoting access to employment for graduates with disabilities, and at the same time liaising with companies and business to make them more aware about disability recruitment policies and how to recruit people with disabilities. And there would be two aims carried out in this regard. Uh, so we have a list of uh, benefits here for employers. I'm not going to go through all of them again because we're against time. But most importantly within WAM is about providing training around disability awareness and employment. And at the same time talking about how to recruit people with disabilities and training processes that need to be carried out. It's, it should be a safe space for somebody who to disabilities to ask for uh, adjustments that they should be able to say and provide information with, with, with employers. And for people who go into the workplace then, we can do a comprehensive assessment on their disability, on the person with the disabilities and for the employer to make sure that their disability strategies and the company is aware of the disability and the supports that should be in place. We provide training uh, and mentoring uh, with, with two employers uh, with the person with disabilities under recruitment. And at the same time, when somebody does start working, we do continue support and advice throughout the, throughout the process. So today, I'm just going to give you a brief synopsis of the research over the last year that was carried out. We have, we have a survey of over 250 individuals uh, working in HR or senior leaderships. Uh, there are different questions about their attitudes to employing people with disability and recruiting people with disabilities. Um, we had, from 2008, we had a previous survey, the same questions that were carried out, but the questions were all about knowing people who work within their organizations with disabilities. And at the same time, there was 25% said that they did, but it was good to see then with the recent survey, there was an increase of of six to sixty-seven percent of people with knowledge of people with disabilities in the employment. And that's quite a positive issue because that shows the visibility of disability in the workplace. And when we ask the questions then about do people do the do people feel diversity in the workplace is important, there was a strong positive response to that kind of question. It helps businesses to create and to feel that they have the right involvement in their businesses. And when you talk about the disabilities perspective, disabled people's perspectives, still it's been very, a positive attitude has been felt. Everybody has felt positive. You know, they've had help businesses to create and to recruit new staff with disabilities. And at the same time, they feel like that there is a moral obligation there to actually carry out these, these recruitments. And the positive attitude has been seen throughout. Also, now 45% of people do when we're asked that if a person doesn't disclose a disability, does it mean there's a breach of trust? 
employers do feel, 45%, nearly half of people think that that would be a breach of trust. And that really is a serious conflict in itself for people who have that disability to disclose. Like Caroline mentioned this morning, she has hidden her disability for 11 to 12 years. So really, you know, was that a breach of trust in herself not to disclose that? And also then, more importantly, asking the questions about the company's willing, are they willing to, dis to accept this disclosure? And over half, asked the, when asked the question, asking disabled people, do they, need, do they need assistance? There was a bit of a confluence in whether they were accepting these adjustments to be made for disabled people or not. And we're waiting for the slide. Woo. So, another question that was asked was about the workplace accommodations. And the reasonable accommodations, the list is nearly inexhaustible. And most people said that they were flexible with work hours, time off, if there was a medical appointment, etc. You know, if there was wheelchair accessibility required or technology. There was a lot there said yes. But the last line, as you can see here, use of sign language interpreters. Well, we have two here today. It's not really a reasonable accommodation. It's only a, a, a couple of percent that do follow that. And we still have a lot of work to make sure that people are aware of accommodations that can be made and should be made. Under WAM, our own research assessments, we have over 200 uh, assessment criteria that we would have gone through. And we found out that two thirds of these wouldn't be, wouldn't have any financial cost linked to work, uh, work tasks and workplace accommodations. So simple things like using email for communication, um, giving, uh, providing bullet points and templates for, for emails, etc. And it's, it's only a small cost to the employer at this point, nominal. I'm waiting again. <laughs> and at the same time, through our research, we have found out that over 2,000 of over 2,000 people that have employment, four from five of them haven't asked for, uh, through the interview, for accommodations. And that then can be linked to their disclosures. Some to people, you know, when they walk and talk, they look like they're normal, they look like there's no issues, there's no disabilities, and they may need accommodations for, this, for their disability, but they don't ask for it in the work. And, and then when they go into the workplace and ask for it, there's that confluence because they haven't asked for it for, through, their interpreter, through their interviews. And 94% of graduates, they feel confident after the WAM placement in work. 87% they said they feel that they better, the employers said they better understand the needs of the disabled staff. Uh, and last slide, uh, WAM, you know, we are a working model. 80% of us, of our graduates, have actually gotten employment after the WAM placement process. And we have two quotes here, as you can see. This one is from a placement. One has been given confidence to apply for a law position uh, that they feel confident that they're able to, and then they will soon become a solicitor. And that has been very impactful. The second one then has said, if it wasn't for WAM, that they would still may be on their disability allowance of 180 euro a week, 188 euro a week. And there's more information here on the links. And now I will pass over to Emma. Thanks, Caroline. Hi everyone, um, my name is Emma Bennett Wren. Um, for those of you that are visually impaired, uh, I have long curly red hair that's half tied up. Um, I'm wearing a pink blouse, uh, black trousers, and my new shiny black shoes <laughs> that I bought specially for this event. <laughs> um, so I am here because I want to speak to you about my journey. So I uh, was a WAM graduate and I'd like to thank Caroline and the NDA for the opportunity to speak with you all today. Um, so I have a disability. Um, I have Asperger's syndrome, which is a form of autism. Um, and this affects me in many different ways. So I sometimes find social experiences difficult. It might tire me in certain situations. Um, so, as you can imagine, the way I work and study, I need to, to find ways that work for me. Um, 
sorry, I'll go to the next slide. Um, so this slide just shows the journey from uh, my education to the workplace. So when I was in secondary school, um, my guidance counsellor helped me to prepare an application uh, to the DARE scheme, uh, Disability Access Route to Education. Um, and this automatically uh, registered me with my college, which was UCD, and uh, their services uh, were in the UCD Access and Lifelong Learning Department and they really helped me. I uh, got um, occupational therapy there to help me to work out how I could study and work in my own unique way. Um, I knew from very early on that a big lecture hall was never going to work for me. Uh, I just can't concentrate. So um, they developed a system where I could record the lectures and listen back in my own time. Um, this was before you know remote learning was a thing. Um, so coming on to then fourth year of college when I had to think about employment um, I was panicking a little that I wouldn't uh, secure employment so um, when my college uh, told me about the WAM placements that were available I jumped on this opportunity and I was really impressed by uh, the recruitment process um, they did a really thorough uh, needs assessment. Um, Dear Jamore conducted my needs assessment and I was so impressed by the whole process. And um, it really gave me the opportunity to really think about the supports that would work for me in the workplace. And I guess this whole um, uh, recruitment process with the WAM uh, and True, True Ahead helped me to integrate into the workplace um, seamlessly and reduce my anxiety in this transition. Um, so I am now working in Pfizer. I started as a QC chemist or quality control chemist in the labs. And um, I started off with certain supports like having a mentor, having uh, more one-on-one -on -one, uh, sessions with my manager that was aware of my disability. And this really helped me to integrate into the workplace. And I was also very impressed by the culture in uh, Pfizer Newbridge on site. It was a very positive atmosphere that had a very strong ED&I culture. Um, but uh, there's always more work to be done. Um, so when the opportunity came up for me to join the graduate program, I jumped on this because um, I, I was just more confident in myself from being so welcomed into the company that I felt like I could um, go for this job and actually get it. Um, so I'll just move on to the next slide. Um, so I got onto the graduate program. I started that early this year, and this gave me the opportunity to uh, join uh, the Ability Group, which is our group on site, which um, uh, we were set up to empower people with disabilities and to um, really strengthen the ED&I culture on site. Uh, so some of the activities we would do, so every October, uh, we've set up uh, an ability month. So last year, uh, it was all about disability awareness. And we moved on from that this year. Uh, we wanted to push even further to disability empowerment. Um, so some of the activities we've been involved in was developing a sensory room on site and also sending out very informative um, researched emails on different types of disabilities. Uh, supports available and also we got some really great personal stories that were shared of colleagues and loved ones on site uh, which was shared to all, all colleagues uh, via email. Um, so moving on now, uh, there's me, uh, red hair, <laughs> uh, it just stands out on the slide there. Um, so uh, another thing that I got involved in was speaking to senior leaders in Pfizer um, such as the Senior Vice President of Small Molecule Operations and also Executive Vice President of Compliance, Quality and Risk. Um, and I guess speaking with these senior leaders made me feel like, you know, these powerful leaders are so busy in their work, but they have the time to listen to people with disabilities. This really meant so much to me um, and really makes a difference if it comes from the top down. Um, and I also felt like much more comfortable in disclosing my disability after uh, these activities. And I feel much more accepting of my disability, like it's nothing to hide from or not, nothing to be ashamed of. 
Um, and I think of it now today as a unique and defining characteristic of myself, something that makes me stand out from the crowd and um, makes me a valuable member of the team. Um, so very quickly, I know we're short for time, I wanted to express what I feel like the benefits are to recruiters uh, with, um, of hiring people with disabilities. So um, you increase the pool um, of talent that you have when you hire people with disabilities because you give people opportunities that may never have even thought of joining the workplace because of their disability by offering the right supports. Um, also, people with disabilities have overcome challenges and obstacles their whole lives, which leads to creativity and innovation. So by employing people with disabilities, you um, increase the innovation on site. Um, also, it has been shown that uh, people with disabilities in the workplace tend to stay longer in a company and also um, they have a better punctuality and accountability. Um, Mainly, I think this might be due to loyalty because um, people with disabilities can be so um, happy to be welcomed onto a site and to be given the right supports that they require. Um, and it also um, increases by hiring people with disability, it increases the strength of the EDI culture on the site, which I think is important to every organization. And I would say that um, don't be afraid to really embrace uh, recruiting people with disabilities. Um, and uh, organisations like AHEAD have been a great support to us um, in our uh, journey to employ graduates with disabilities. So thank you. That's all. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Emma and Caroline. Um, and the public appointment service, I think, have been doing the recruitment for the public sector work placements for about 15, 18 years now. Um, and it's a pleasure to partner with AHEAD. And this year we're even looking at, we're trialling a, a pathway to permanency for these work placement people so that we can keep this talent in the ser service and they just don't cycle out and go on to bigger and better things elsewhere. So um, thank you very much to all the presenters. We've got four minutes and 13 seconds for questions. I, I, I don't know if there are any questions uh, online. I'm sorry, I can't. Or in the audience, anywhere. Thanks. Um, so yeah, there's a range of questions. I'm, I'm gonna have to just be a bit selective in terms of the time. So uh, there's a question about, I suppose, the, the whole EDI uh, sort of concept, if you like, and the question is, is there a diversity hierarchy? And if there is, where does disability come in that hierarchy? Um, and then in relation to the disability employment charter, um, and I know Kim referred to the importance of cons consultation, uh, the question is about were disabled people involved in the design of the charter? Uh, how is the success of the charter going to be measured and what data are you capturing? I don't know if we have any more time for any, that's probably the limit in terms of four minutes. Do you want to start with the... Okay, yeah, should yeah. I talk about the charter? So were disabled people involved? Absolutely, yes. Um, a lot of the founder members of the charter themselves are disabled and of course represents uh, organisations which are uh, disabled people's organisations. Um, in terms of um, what would we view to be a success, uh, ultimately to see a, a, a reduced disability employment and pay gap at national level, uh, which we would like to see as a result of the introduction of the policies that we have outlined in the Charter. That will be a major, major step forward um, to get those uh, uh, policies into uh, parties' manifestos and then uh, enacted. Um, data, I guess, will be again at national level. Um, like I say, you know, if we do see a reduced disability employment and pay gap, um, I'll be very happy. My worry is if the government does implement everything we've recommended and it doesn't improve anything, then I'll go and crawl under a rock somewhere, maybe. <laughs> Great, thank you for that. Um, I I'll just give two seconds on, on the original question around as to whether there's a hierarchy of um, 
equality grounds. I'd, I'd love to sit here and say there isn't. I think we all know that it's relative. Um, certainly since I've come back to the public sector in Ireland, the focus has very much been on gender and disability. I, I don't know if that's the same in the private sector. Uh, we are way behind on other groups, uh, migrants and ethnic minorities. Uh, we've just a, done a big piece of work with ERSI to crunch all the data that we have, because about 50,000 people apply to the public service every year. So we know exactly who's applying and who isn't to the public service and where they're falling out and where they're falling out in our processes. Um, and so we only have about three or four percent of people who are declaring a disability on the way through our processes, through the recruitment process. They are tiny numbers. Um, and even within that, uh, the reasonable accommodation requests during that process are minimal as well. So lots of people are coming through who have disabilities but don't require reasonable accommodation processes during the recruitment process. Um, so I would hate to say that there's a pecking order. I think that there is a lot of work to, to be done across all areas, um, but we can't drop the ball on disability and it feels sometimes like it does take a back seat in people's priorities. Um, Pamela, I don't know if, if you want to talk about ED&I from the uh, Department of Justice perspective. Um, sorry, can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Yeah. No, I think I agree with that. That we, we were quite conscious um, in when looking at the strategy to really try and move. And I said, you know, in terms of data, what we would have would be just kind of uh, gender and disability data. And, and again, we've seen some improvements in how we've capturing that. But we've a long way to go to really understand, you know, all of the other equality grounds and that. And that's one of the key actions that we're actually going to be following up on. So that is so it is important that we keep that you know, just intersectional um, intersectionality aspect of it as well. Great, thank you. Uh, I don't know if we have time for any more questions. There, I could just see one or two hands up. Can we take them? Three minutes. Oh God, loads of time. <laughs> yeah, just a quick question for Professor Hawk about the disability pay gap and uh, the findings with respect to promotion of people with disabilities employment. So does the disability gap stem um, from that study, uh, from the findings of that study, uh, is, it, is it a selection effect at the point of recruitment? Or do you, did you derive any insights about promotion and to what degree the, the, the gap is explained by one or the other? Um, likely to be both. I mean, it's not our study. It's the Office for National Statistics who produced that uh, graph, and I just stole it. Um, so effectively, this is just a, a comparison of disabled and non-disabled people in terms of their hourly pay rates. Um, I think the graph I put up is for full-timers. Um, and it is that like with like comparison between the two, which which will be explained by the fact that disabled people will be in different types of uh, jobs. But that itself is, you know, an indication of the, the, the sort of disadvantage that disabled people face. Now, of course, in the charter, the idea about asking about um, uh, the, the percentage of disabled people in each pay quartile is to ensure they're not clustering at the bottom. Uh, within an organisation uh, of the bottom of their pay scale, which in itself would be a proxy for whether they're progressing through the organisation uh, into higher level uh, uh, organisational roles, which will be paid better. Was there, there's another question there, I think, is there? Hello, this is Paula Sorhin from Independent Living Movement Ireland. It's just a question, um, particularly for the Disability Employment Charter for Kim, for yourself. I really enjoyed your speech. Uh, one thing that really sticks out for me as a proud disabled woman is um, the difference between disability awareness and disability equality. I feel personally that disability awareness can um, be a barrier and um, it really kind of just makes people aware of disabled people's conditions or impairments, it doesn't actually take into account too much the actual physical environment barriers and the attitudinal barriers that we face. So my question is, um, would you agree with that statement and that we in Ireland need to move from disability awareness to disability equality? 
Uh, yeah, I mean, obviously, disability equality is what we're aiming at. I mean, within individual organisations, there will be different routes by which that will be achieved. And some of the things that Caroline Casey was talking about earlier and some of the things that we've heard about Pfizer, for example, um, are great examples of what individual companies can do. I mean, I guess what we're focusing in is what government can do to push the agenda within different companies. We can't really uh, be prescriptive in terms of, other than providing advice and guidance around what works, what done, what, where the evidence lies. Um, but it's really about what the government can do to set the tone by really saying to companies, you need to vote to employers, you need to focus on this, you need to push this up your agenda. And one of the ways we will do this, for example, is through mandatory disability employment and pay gap reporting. So it becomes absolutely clear where organisations are doing well, where they're doing badly, they can be benchmarked against averages in their sectors, uh, and so on. So I don't know if that answers your question, but I mean, it's very much about equality. It is very much about outcomes, for example, in terms of what we're recommending in terms of um, uh, disability confidence is moving away from a focus on uh, processes and procedures uh, and to a focus on outcomes. Because ultimately, if it doesn't lead to disabled people being employed in greater numbers or being promoted up the hierarchy, what's the point? You know, it is literally nothing more than diversity, uh, you know, diversity washing uh, in many ways, looking good when ultimately you're not actually achieving the outcomes that we would want to see. Absolutely, thank Great. you. Thanks very much for that. Um, we're just about to close this panel, but I just wanted to ask um, Emma and Caroline if they have a final message for employers out there who understand the benefit of having this talent in their organisations, but don't know how to go about it or what their first step would be, obviously other than joining one of a HEADS programmes. Um, so I think the very first step is actually look at what everyone was saying here today is like, how is your, what's your communication? What's the messages on your website saying? Um, is your job descriptions accessible? Is your promotional material, you know, talking about all your different opportunities? Does it have subtitles? Does your graphics have alternative text? Like even that baseline of accessibility shows that you are wanting to make your job opportunities open for people with disabilities. So I think that's probably the very first step is actually stepping back and looking at the communications that you're actually sending out. Um, I think uh, it's important um, when thinking about hiring people with disabilities is to make sure that everyone on a site um, is educated. Um, so that's what we tried to do last year is to make sure that everyone was educated and knew what the right language and behaviours were uh, to use. Uh, for example, um, we encourage people to use uh, the phrase people with disabilities instead of disabled people, um, because it's about the person first. Um, and also um, in hiring uh, people with disabilities, it's so important to listen to the voices of the people with the disabilities because they know what supports they might need. Um, so they are the experts in a way. Absolutely. Great. Well, I'll leave it there. We're well over time. Um, so thanks very much to uh, my uh, panel here. We could spend another hour on this subject, I suspect. And thanks to everybody here for your attention. I think lunch is now. <laughs>